Hello everybody, my name is Rachel and welcome back to my channel. So today's case is a solved one, but it does involve domestic violence. So I wanted to say that from the very beginning because obviously this is a true crime channel and we talk about a lot of difficult things, but some things can feel a lot more personal to others. And so if this subject is really difficult for you to listen to, then this video probably is not for you. So I just wanted to first and foremost, put out that warning to you guys in case this is is an extra sensitive subject to you. Also, before we get into the video, I just wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Native. Native is a regular sponsor here on this channel and it's for a good reason. I absolutely love their products and I use them literally every single day. Native deodorant is a vegan, cruelty-free deodorant that's aluminum-free, paraben-free with natural ingredients like coconut oil and shea butter. It has an amazing, smooth, non-sticky formula that dries very quickly. Right now, I work at a hospital, which has me running around literally everywhere, walking up several flights of stairs at one time, and working with patients very hands-on, so it's really important that I'm smelling fresh throughout the entire day, and Native has me covered. This time, I got a bunch of scents that remind me of summer. The scents I have are Sweet Peach and Nectar, which is probably my favorite right now. It just reminds me of summer and floral vibes. I absolutely love this one. Then, I have some surf and sea moss, which just makes me feel like I'm on vacation and soaking up the beach. And then lastly, I have key lime and sugar, which just smells so fresh, so sweet and delicious. I also love Native's other personal care products. I have their body wash and their toothpaste. And ever since I started using them, I haven't stopped. Their body wash smells so amazing and both their body wash and toothpaste just make me feel so clean and fresh and just amazing. And if you're someone who's more interested in more sustainable sustainable packaging. Native also offers a plastic-free version of their same deodorant with their same amazing formula. Last year, they actually donated over $2 million worth of product to Hope and Comfort, a nonprofit organization to help deliver health and confidence to those in need. Now, three deodorants usually goes for $36, but if you go ahead and click the link down below and use code RACHELSHANNON6, you can get a three-pack for $24, which is actually 33% off. You can also use my code RACHELSHANNON6 to get 20% off of body wash and their toothpaste. I am so excited about these deals for you guys because you know how much I love Native and all of their products. So thank you again to Native for sponsoring today's video. Okay, so with all of that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the vicious murder of Jeanette Reyna. Jeanette Reyna was born October 27th, 1983 in Brownsville, Texas to her parents, Javier and Patricia Reyna. Jeanette grew up in Houston, Texas and graduated from Elsick High School. After high school, she moved to Ponca City, Oklahoma with her mother. There, she attended Northern Oklahoma College and graduated with her associates in criminal justice. By 2008, she completed her Council on Law Enforcement Education and Training, or CLEAT, and became an officer for the Blackwell Police Department. Then, by 2012, she became the director of the Domestic Violence Program for the Ponca Native American Tribe. During her work there, she helped over 60 victims of domestic violence. She was described by her coworkers as being amazing at her job. She helped women in abusive situations find emergency shelters as well as long-term shelters and other resources. She was just somebody who was very kind and gentle towards people that she was helping that they trusted her immediately and she got people to open up very quickly. Jeanette went on to have three children, Alia, Chloe, and Louise. She was described as being such a proud mother and police officer. She was so passionate about helping others, especially women in abusive of situations. She was also described as a woman who was always laughing. She loved music and everyone around her thought that she had the perfect life and thought that she had everything together. She had such an amazing career that she loved. She was in the process of buying a home. She had a luxury car and she had three beautiful children and a husband. Now, Jeanette had been dating a man named Luis Frias. She had met him while she was in college while working at a meat production plant. It was interesting because Jeanette's mom was actually a little bit worried about her meat Louise because he was basically a spitting image of her ex. And sure enough, once the two started talking, it seemed like they had an instant connection. The two never actually got married, but they were together long enough and lived together long enough that they actually legally became common law husband and wife. And to those on the outside looking in, she appeared to have the most amazing relationship with him. When she was pregnant with her first child, everything seemed to be amazing. She was a natural mother and both of them were so ecstatic to welcome their first beautiful 
beautiful child into the world. She always had the most beautiful pictures of herself and her family and Luis all over her desk at work. He was always sending her flowers at work. Her coworkers envied just how amazing her life appeared to be. However, despite her dedication to helping other women who were in domestic violence situations, she too had been suffering in silence. Her relationship with Luis was actually anything but perfect. She had been facing years of domestic abuse. Now, as the years went on in the relationship, Luis just became more and more possessive over Jeanette. Even her family started seeing more of Luis's jealous side. They had witnessed many arguments between the two of them, usually stemming from how jealous Luis was. There was one instance that Jeanette's brother recalled where a man had literally just looked at Jeanette, and this made Luis so angry and jealous that he went up to this man, confronted him, and tried starting a fight with him. One of Jeanette's friends and co-workers, Monique Guerra Houston, said that his obsession and jealousy started turning more and more into physical violence. He started recording their personal conversations, and the daily violence that Jeanette was facing became more and more serious. Those around Jeanette started seeing what was happening in the relationship, but just as so many other victims of domestic violence do, she just suffered in silence. Now, back in 2007, when Jeanette originally applied for her position at the Blackwell Police Department, there was a test that she had to pass to even be considered for the position, and she passed. However, Chief Dwayne Wood stated that her family life was a bit of concern to them. They actually knew Luis, and they had dealt with him several times for things like fights or alcohol, but every time they were just minor offenses. They were also familiar with Luis's mother, because she had a bit of a violent history. She actually slashed another woman's face at some point, so they knew that she was a bit violent herself. I couldn't find anything else about this situation and why she did it. All I know is that they know that she slashed somebody's face for whatever reason, but that doesn't mean that directly affects Jeanette and her work as an officer. So they moved forward with her interview and the hiring process. They did their home visit and started interviewing Jeanette's friends and family, which included Luis. At the time of the interview, they asked him how he felt about this job and Luis actually seemed really excited and supportive in this new path in Jeanette's life. He seemed really excited for her and he made that known in the interview. However, by the time she actually got the job and got started, it seemed like Luis was doing everything in his power to make her life as difficult as possible. Those around her thought that maybe he was just getting really jealous of all of the men that she was always around at her job. All she wanted to do was build herself up and excel in her career. And she did. She was an amazing police officer and was such a huge asset to law enforcement. She was so proud of what she was doing and she saw this as one of her greatest accomplishments. However, Luis would constantly go to the police chief and just complain about Jeanette. He would say things like she's not a good mother and just other things like that, other really negative things about her all the time. He was trying to do whatever he could to break her down. He didn't want her to be successful. He couldn't stand the thought of her being independent and proud of her own work. To me, I get the idea that not only was he jealous of the other men and just people around her in her life, but he was jealous that that she was able to succeed without him. She was doing so well for herself and he wanted to do whatever he could to get in the way of that. So he became such a problem to the police department that after only a year of working there, she had no choice but to resign. By 2010, the situation between them was getting so bad that she actually reached out to her friends at the police department in two occasions and took out a protective order against him. There was one instance where he even pulled a gun on her and he was arrested. But just as it happens in so many other cases of intimate partner violence, she got sucked back in and dropped the charges against him and dropped the protective order. She was in a really difficult situation. I mean, he was the father of her three children. She shared a home with him. She wanted to give her kids a better life than what she had. She didn't really have an involved father growing up and she wanted differently for her own kids. And we know that it's a cycle in so many abusive situations where the abuser will promise change and then start acting like they've changed and start acting like the perfect partner that the victim has always asked for. But 
before they can even blink an eye, they just go back to the same old behaviors. So then as we know, after working for the Blackwell Police Department in 2012, she started working as the director of the domestic violence program on the Ponca Tribe Reservation. Again, those around her said that she was the perfect fit for this position and she helped so many women in abusive relationships. But nobody knew that she was dealing with her own domestic abuse situation. Her family said that it seemed that she took pride in helping other women escape their abusive situations because she couldn't escape herself. At this point, things had escalated to the point where Louise had found a way to hack into Jeanette's work cell phone and also put a tracking device on her personal cell phone and her car. There was actually one time where Louise broke into her office and started rifling through her desk and going through her things. Police were called to report him breaking in, but he fled before anybody got there, so nothing ever came of that. At this point, she felt absolutely trapped. Now, for quite a while, she did not know that he had all of these tracking devices on her, but she would text him something like, oh, I'm still at the office, and he would reply with, no, you're not, you're still at the store, or wherever she was. He always knew where she was and what she was doing, but for the longest time, she had no idea how he knew. But one day, she had been at home just cleaning when she found a small box that she knew belonged to a GPS tracker. She was a cop, after all, so she would know what these things look like. So, it was at that point that she knew that Louise had been tracking her. So, after finding this, she finally decided that enough was enough. So then, by August of 2013, with the support of her family, Jeanette decided to take out another protective order against Louise, and this time, she was sticking to it. She had the help of her family to get her a new apartment where she could live with her three children. She was finally getting herself out of this horrible situation. Her and her family waited until Louise was at work, and they packed up everything very swiftly and left, and they would not tell Louise where she was going. She thought that at this moment, she was finally saving her own life and her children's lives. But this decision absolutely infuriated Luis. He knew that he was losing control and there was nothing that he could do about it. He started making all sorts of threats towards Jeanette and did everything that he could to figure out where her and the kids were living. He would text her over and over again saying, where the F are you? And you're not taking your kids from me. Now, two days after the protection order had been taken out on August 8th, 2013, Louise's mother, Atota Beltran, had gotten into contact with Jeanette to ask her if she can see her grandchildren. Even though Jeanette had absolutely no intentions of getting back together with Louise and wanted no part of seeing him, she thought that it was only fair that Atota get to see her grandchildren. So, she thought that it would be okay to drop them off with her, thinking that Louise wasn't going to be there. Plus, this was something that she had done many times before. She had the help of her coworker and friend, Monique, to facilitate the visit just like they had done many times in the past without any problems. So on that day, Jeanette took her children to their grandmother's house to her apartment on the second floor of the building. When 29-year-old Jeanette, her three children, and Monique arrived, Monique watched as they all walked up to the stairs to Atocha's apartment. For a few moments, she heard Jeanette and Atocha speaking to each other in Spanish, and then she saw Jeanette kiss her kids before she was about to leave. But unlike any of the other previous visits, Monique suddenly heard a scream coming from the apartment. She watched as Louise jumped out from behind the door of the apartment, pulled Jeanette inside, and then slammed the door behind them. It seemed like they had this entire thing set up because neither Jeanette or Monique knew that Louise was going to be there. This immediately caused Monique to spin into a complete panic. She realized that she had left her cell phone in Jeanette's car, but it was parked a few blocks away. So she ran over to the car to get her phone as fast as she possibly could, and she dialed 911. She didn't know the area very well, so she had to run back to the apartment as fast as she could to see the address to give to the dispatcher. But as she ran back, she could just hear Jeanette screaming her name from the inside as loud as she could. So Monique just started running around to as many neighbors' doors as she could and was just knocking on their doors to see if if she could find anybody else that would help. Now, Monique wasn't the only one calling police for help. Jeanette's three children were also inside of the apartment witnessing what was happening, so Jeanette's daughter, who was only seven years old at the time, grabbed the phone and was frantically dialing 911 to get some help. But before she was able to get connected to a dispatcher, her grandmother, Atota Beltran, snatched the phone away from her so that she couldn't call for help. But on the outside, Monique was still on the phone with police, and police told her to 
to stay on the phone with them, and she did. But she soon told the dispatcher that she could no longer hear screaming coming from inside the apartment. Then, just as she was about to walk back upstairs to the apartment, she saw Louise running out of the apartment. At this point, Monique had no idea what just happened, so she decided to walk into the apartment to see what was going on, and what she walked into was absolutely horrific. It was her absolute worst fear and the most brutal thing that she could have imagined happening to her friend. When she walked into the apartment, she said the first thing she noticed was a very strong smell of blood. She said that blood is a smell that you cannot mistake and you just can't forget. The door was initially cracked open a little bit and she walked in and she saw blood everywhere. Jeanette was laying face down on the ground right next to the door, absolutely absolutely covered in blood. Turns out, once Jeanette got to the home, Louise was lying in wait for when she dropped off the kids and then snatched her inside and closed the door so that she couldn't leave. He then grabbed a knife from the kitchen and right in front of their three children, he started stabbing Jeanette over and over and over again. He just kept going and he stabbed her so many times that he didn't even know how many times he stabbed her. Apparently, as that was happening, Atocha tried grabbing him off of her and she actually ended up ripping his shirt. Louise ended up stabbing Jeanette a total of 41 times to her face, chest, and torso. After stabbing her, Atocha took the three kids and put them into a separate room and started cleaning up the crime scene. She went and started by rinsing off the knife. So, so now going back to when Monique originally got into the apartment. Monique went in there and just started screaming Jeanette's name over and over again when Atocha suddenly came out of another room and was holding one of the kids and was screaming at Monique, but she couldn't understand exactly what she was saying. As she was yelling at her, she was walking towards her, so Monique just turned around and left the apartment and went back outside. By the time Monique went back outside, she saw police starting to pull up, and immediately, police recognized the victim as Jeanette. One of the officers, who was the first one to go in there, came back outside to talk to another officer and he was visibly shaken up. He just kept saying, it's Jeanette. Louise killed Jeanette. But shortly after police arrived, Atocha came out of the apartment with her hands up yelling, I did it, I did it. She tried taking full responsibility for the murder but police knew that it wasn't her. They knew that it was Louise. So police pulled the kids out of the apartment and asked Monique if she could sit with them, and of course she did. Monique remembers one of the kids saying, I need to go home and change because she had actually wet herself after witnessing her dad hitting her mom with a knife over and over again. Now, once police arrived on scene, Louise was nowhere to be found, but investigators started their search for him immediately. They put out a mass message saying that they are looking for Louise Fria and pretty quickly they received a tip. The tipster actually told them that Louise had family in Enid, Oklahoma, about an hour away from where they lived. After getting this tip, police were certain that they were going to catch up with him. However, by the time they got there, they had just missed him. Turns out he had gotten into contact with a friend named Nisha Niemeyer and she drove him to his aunt's house in Enid and then the aunt gave him a ride to Wichita, Kansas. Of course, after finding this out, police rushed over there hoping to catch him there but once again, they were too late. He had already hopped on a bus that was headed south. All they knew at that point was that he had hopped on a bus headed to the West Texas area, but they actually figured out what bus he had gotten onto and they arrived at the bus's last stop before the bus got there. But by the time the bus reached this stop, Luis was no longer on it. He had gotten off the bus somewhere, but they didn't know where, and they didn't know where he went after that. After police figured out who helped Luis initially escape, she was arrested and charged with accessory. But after that, they had no idea where he went from there. Now, like I said, Atocha tried taking full responsibility for Jeanette's murder, but police knew that this was all Luis's doing. But she did take part in setting her up to drop her kids off so that he could ambush her. So they swiftly arrested her for accessory to murder for her role in basically allowing this to happen in her own home, preventing her grandchildren from calling for help and trying to cover it up for him. She was sentenced to 20 years for this. But at this point, they had no idea where Luis went. He was a fugitive on the run and he was added to the U.S. Marshal's 15 most wanted fugitive list and they were asked 
asking public for help in finding him. He was actually on the run for about five years before the TV show In Pursuit with John Walsh aired an episode on the murder in January of 2019. After this episode aired, an anonymous tipster actually called the U.S. Marshals and provided them with information that led investigators into locating Luis. The U.S. Marshals had already been working pretty closely with the Mexican police, which is where the tipster believed Luis to be. They worked together and they were able to narrow down Luis's location to a suburb in Guadalajara. He was located and arrested at 6.30 p.m. on February 6, 2019. He was taken back to U.S. soil the next day and police actually used Jeanette's handcuffs to serve him his arrest warrant and take him to jail. He pled guilty to first-degree murder and pled no contest against a conspiracy charge against him for luring her into his mother's apartment. At the hearing, Luis testified that he just wanted to talk about their relationship, but I don't believe this at all. He said that when she got there, he went into the kitchen and grabbed a knife and started stabbing her, as we know. He said that after he killed her, he ran off into the nearby woods and then got a ride from this friend to his aunt's house in Enid. Once there, he just hopped on buses until he got to Mexico. Once in Mexico, he lived there for five years and took on a different name. At this hearing, he was crying and sobbing and saying that he's sorry, but saying that he knows sorry isn't enough for what he did. He said that he loved and cared for Jeanette with all of his heart, but we know that he didn't. He only cared about controlling her. Now, the prosecution left it up to the family whether they wanted to do a trial for the death penalty or just leave it at life without parole, and the family opted for life without parole. They didn't want to go through a whole trial and put Jeanette's kids through the trauma of reliving this tragedy. So, that's the sentence he got, plus an additional 10 years for conspiracy. So, of course, Luis is still in jail for the murder, and hopefully he will be for the rest of his life. But his mother, Atocha Beltran, who I believe took almost just as much of a part in this murder, was actually released from prison at the age of 56 last year on February 13th, 2020, after serving only six years of her 20-year sentence. They gave three reasons for her being released. First, they cited severe prison overcrowding. They said that she hadn't had any instances of misconduct since arriving. They also noted that she was a participant in a Christian substance abuse program trying to change herself for the better. When her attorney spoke on her being released, he said that the only two things to get her charged with this crime was simply giving police the wrong directions and just throwing the knife into the sink and turning on the water. He neglects to mention how she literally took part in luring the mother of her own grand children over to her own home, fully knowing that Luis was going to attack her, and the fact that she planned to take credit for the entire thing after the fact. To me, it just seems like a slap in the face that she was already released. She didn't even serve half of her sentence, which is ridiculous. It's like, what's the point of even giving a 20-year sentence for this? I wholeheartedly believe that if she hadn't called Jeanette over, that she wouldn't have been killed, or at least when she was. Luis did not know where she was at the time. She had no plans of seeing him or letting her kids near him. But there was this small part of her that thought, okay, I guess my kids can see their grandma. And that's what got her killed. It's absolutely horrific. I haven't seen that her family said anything about Atocha being released, but I'm sure nobody is happy about it. But at least the man who put her through so much pain and suffering for so many years is finally behind bars. These are some of the worst cases for me to talk about because they're just so complicated. So many people on the outside of these abusive relationships will look at people like Jeanette and blame her for what happened to her. They'll blame them and say, why didn't you just leave? But what people don't realize is just how dangerous it really is for somebody to leave. The most dangerous situation a domestic abuse victim can put themselves in is leaving the abuser. That's actually when most of these murders happen in these exact situations, when they finally realize that they lost all control. It's just so frustrating to me when an abuser says something like, you aren't going to take my kids away from me only to take their mother away from them and then flee the country and leave them anyways. It just makes me so angry because he had the audacity to cry at his hearing and talk about just how much he cared about Jeanette when he's literally the reason that three children are left without a father and a mother. It was never about the kids. He never cared about her taking his kids away from him. He only cared about continuing to control her and the kids. 
I know I just posted a video about domestic violence a few weeks ago, but this is even more of an obvious case. I just want to take a moment to make sure that everybody understands how these relationships happen. It's not the victim's fault for not leaving. Again, it's so dangerous for a victim to leave an abusive relationship. That is the time when most victims are killed. It's when they finally decide to leave. They know that living in this house with this person that they're going to be hit and abused but they know that if they ever try to leave, their abuser will be so upset with them that they will try to kill them. There's never any guarantee that a victim can stay hidden, especially if the abuser was able to find a way to track them without the victim's knowledge. Again, we know that Louise was tracking Jeanette and the only reason she even found out was because she found evidence of it. I'm sure there's so many cases where the abuser is tracking their victims and keeping tabs on them without the person ever finding out. Out. And that is just so, so scary knowing that that happens. Again, if you ever know someone in or who has gotten out of an abusive relationship, please never ask them, oh, why didn't you just leave? Or, oh, why did you stay with them for so long if they were treating you so badly? Because as we can see, leaving is a lot of times exactly what gets the victim killed. And a lot of times, even when the victims are trying to leave, they don't get help from anybody, let alone police. A lot of times they're completely alone. A lot of times the abuser will make it so that the victim has no other security net. They'll isolate them from their friends and their family. And a lot of times, especially with friends, if you realize that your friend is just completely ignoring you and you have no idea why, you can feel that it's personal, especially if you have no idea that they're being abused. If your friend just suddenly stops talking to you and won't hang out with you, it might feel personal. It might feel like, oh, they just don't like me anymore. So then this friend starts to resent them. And then when they do try to help, they think, well, we're not really friends. We don't really talk anymore. I don't know. It's just a huge cycle where the abuser will figure out every single way to make the victim the most isolated, the most vulnerable, and the most dependent on them. Again, I know I sound like a total broken record when it comes to cases like this, but please just keep an eye out for one another. If you suspect that your friend or a family member might be in this type of situation, just talk to them, try to listen, be an open ear for them, and never allow them to be separated from you because that is when the most damage happens. This situation is just so unfortunate and horrific that it happened the way it did and my heart absolutely aches for those three kids. He didn't even have the decency to leave his kids out of it, to wait for grandma to take him out of the house for a minute. Nothing. He viciously murdered a mother right in front of her three children. Her three young children who didn't even understand what was happening at the time. That just makes me so angry and it's hard to even contain because the fact that he did that just makes me so freaking angry and I wish there was more that we could do, but I'm glad he's in jail. I'm glad he finally got justice for this. I'm glad that he was found after five years in hiding. He's a coward and there's nothing else that can explain it. Anybody who beats a woman, who kills a woman, or hurts his kids is a coward. I can't even imagine the amount of therapy that these kids must have needed to get through all of that. I just hope that they ended up okay and are living their lives the best way that they can without their beautiful mother with them. So that is all I have for today's video. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to go ahead and follow me on Twitter and Instagram, both be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to go ahead and send them over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have a great week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.